Hello, hello. Thank you for joining us on this, is it Wednesday? Yes, it is. This Wednesday evening uh, or late afternoon or mid afternoon, depending on where you are. We're so excited to be here with Marisa Siegel and Trisha Previtt and our own Lydia Yuknovich. Um, I'm Daniel from Corporeal Writing. Um, and yeah, we're here to celebrate Thick Stars, a new book from Marisa and Trisha. Um, I am gonna turn you over to them in just a moment. Uh, in Thick Stars, Marisa Siegel investigates the in-between. Windows, porches, drawers, bedrooms, and basements are portals to examine how language shapes and is shaped and to what ends. With original artwork by Trisha Previtt, Thick Stars is a lush voyage through trauma and toward the reestablishment of hope. Uh, Marisa Siegel lives, writes, and edits near New York City. She holds an MFA in poetry from Mills College in Oakland, California. Her essay, Inherited Anger, appears in the anthology Burn It Down from Seal Press 2019. And her debut poetry chapbook, Thick Stars, is forthcoming from Borough Press. Not forthcoming anymore, I guess it's out from Borough Press in April 2022. Um, she is senior acquiring editor for trade at Northwestern University Press and editor at large for The Beloved Rumpus. Follow her on Twitter at Marisa Says Tweet. Trisha Previtt is an illustrator, designer, and explorer hailing from Cleveland, Ohio, and based in New York City. She received her BFA in Fine Arts from the Stamped School of Art and Design at the University of Michigan with a minor in Environmental Studies. And Lydia Yuknovich is the author of the short story collection Verge, the novels The Book of Joan, The Small Backs of Children, and Dora, A Headcase, and the anti-memoir The Chronology of Water. Her new novel, Thrust, is forecoming this June from Riverhead Books. She lives and collaborates in Portland, Oregon, right here at Corporeal Writing, and she is a very good swimmer. And uh, now I'm gonna turn it over to the three of them. Thanks all for being here. Thank you, Daniel, and um, welcome. However, you're showing up for this amazing event. I'm so tinkle cry happy to be here because I love Marisa so much. I've known her for years and I um, this book makes me giddy. And this is the first time I'm meeting Trisha, but I will promptly stalk her. <laughs> I went and looked at her beautiful artwork and it again made me so happy. And as Katie knows, tinkle is my highest form of compliment. So big time tinkle dance. Well, hello, brilliant, beautiful humans. Um, I have to start uh, by talking first or asking first uh, how you came into relationship on this project, how you came, how you know each other, how this sort of became a meeting and a braid. I guess I'll start and hi and thanks everyone for being here and Lydia and Corporeal for having us and Trisha for joining me and making the book look beautiful. Um, I'm actually, I'm gonna start with Ryan Rivas who I think is in the audience with us, my publisher because this was his idea. Um, I showed him my chapbook and he said, what if we added artwork? And I said, oh, that would be cool. Uh, and then I went and thought about what kind of art I wanted. Um, we knew we wanted black and white artwork. And if you look at Trisha's portfolio, you will see that that is her specialty. Um, I had known Trisha for a few years, at least. Um, she had been a rumpus illustrator uh, for three or four years. And I had worked with her in that capacity. And I reached out to her and said, hey, you want to make a book? And she was like, yeah, cool. <laughs> um, and thereafter, we spent about two years meeting on Google Meets and making this happen um maybe a year and a half i feel like it was about two years all told from when we started the conversation to when it was finished and the images were done but trisha i'll let you like fill in the blanks there yeah no i think two years is about right i mean we we had a couple delays with covid and and all sorts of life events happening but uh, I, I was just thrilled when Marisa reached out to me. We had been, like, as she said, been working together through the Rumpus. I remember years ago now, she had put out a call for art for the Rumpus, like anyone who wanted to illustrate short stories. And I, and I saw it on Twitter and I said, oh my goodness, that sounds lovely. And I, I shot her an email and here we are today. That's, that was the start of the relationship. And I, and I couldn't be more grateful that she brought me on board. Well, so if you guys were kind of toggling back and forth for a year or two, I mean, what was that like? Marisa, did you say, here's some words? And Tricia said, here's some image. Like, how did that 
movie. I'm trying to remember where it began because I feel like Trisha, did I give you notes at the start or did we start with like you went and made some sketches and then we talked about them? I'm pretty sure what I did was you gave me the manuscript and I, I did like a deep reading of it. And I remember, cause like I annotated the crap out of it. <laughs> yes. I like, I have my copy where it's like all written <laughs> over. Uh, and I think at that point, I want to say we decided to do like a couple sample sketches first. Like I ideated a few things and I think I, I want to say it was like about three or so sample images so that I could like get an idea if I, if I was on the right track or not, if it made sense. And and then from there, I feel like you and I had a call and I, I showed you like where I was thinking and then like kind of gave you an idea of like themes or like motifs that I plan to include throughout. And then it was just a lot of back and forth from there. And, and you also gave me like some starting points to like reference images and things like that. Yes. And we taught, we broke it into sections. So we worked on, um, you know, first that we wanted an image from each section that we could use to preview the book as we were announcing it to the world. So we worked on those three images first. And that's what you'll see if you go to boroughpress.com slash stars and see this images that are highlighted there. Those were the first three images that Trisha and I finished. Um, or that Trisha finished. And then, um, yeah, we just kind of went image by image. Now, when Trisha says she makes a sketch, that sounds like very loosey goosey, but her sketches often look to me like finished art. And then when she brings them back, they're just even more finished. Um, so I feel like there were very few moments. There were a couple, but like very few where it was a totally rough sketch. Like I remember the fi uh, filing cabinet printer one is one we came back to a few times. The kitchen, the kitchen table one was rough. home <laughs> control. That was the hardest one in the last image that I think we finished, that you finished. Um, yeah because we had a lot of ideas and none of them were translating uh, yeah. kind of onto the page because we kept putting bodies on them. And then one, that one day Trisha was like, what if we didn't put bodies there? <laughs> that was the answer. Um, so it was sort of just kind of like, yeah, we were batting a ball back and forth. Um, with the exception of the image of the cat though, I really left a lot of the creative decisions around the art to Trisha um, because I wanted it to feel like it was her work. And also it is really fascinating and awesome to watch what an artist like takes yeah. from your poetry and what themes jump out at them and, and how that comes to life on the page. Yeah, I kept thinking about kind of conceptual ideas like translation or interpretation or adaptation while I was looking um, and it, at certain points, it seemed like they were in dialogue with each other. Um, and I just love that there's this third motion between word, image, and those words I just named, you know, this, this action that the reader participates in, that you participated in too. Um, um, Marisa, let me ask you another question kind of about the structure of the writing um, that we'll make a little bridge to having a look at maybe some of the images uh, that Trisha created that are so beautiful. Sure. Um, so first tell me if this is a fair thing to say. In my experience of reading the work, I saw a series of associative leaps. And sometimes that was off of a single word, like as a lodestar. Um, and sometimes it was a poem would move to another poem associatively. Um, so can you talk a little bit, if that's anywhere near true for you, can you talk a little bit about just the motion of the poems? Because it doesn't feel random. It's not random because my editor brain is very loud. And so, and, and I should say, a, I mean, a large chunk of this chapbook is my graduate school thesis. I graduated from graduate school in 2008. That is a really fucking long time ago. So um, I've had a lot of time to sit with what the structure of this is, what I wanted to take out, what I wanted to move around. Um, I think there's a lot of associate, I think my writing uh, might be described as weird 
and not uh, like concrete necessarily, uh, not narrative. Um, so there is this associative feeling when you move between them and that is totally intentional. I want the reader to feel disoriented um, on shaky ground. And I feel like these are the sorts of things I said to Trisha. Um, and then I said, so how do you make that happen in art? Um, and I'm thinking of like the image, there's an image in the book that's like a floating block, uh, like street block. And there's all these street signs and there are like fish swimming around the street signs. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like this super weird image, but it, but it is actually concrete because it's there on the page. And it somehow turns my like, this is tied to a poem that is making tons of associative leaps uh, that starts with a visit to uh, the Japanese tea garden at the Met and ends who knows where. Um, and so I think there we go. Um, that one. So, uh, you know, I think Trisha captured that associativeness, if that's, I don't think that's a word, but I'm gonna make it a word really well here. Um, but I also don't, I don't wanna pretend that like the structure of the book is too intentional. Yeah. To some extent, it's also, the first section are the box poems. That's what I call them in my head. The second section is this investigation that's kind of happening. And then the third section are the details, are the poems that are a little bit more specific, a little bit more narrative. Don't don't assume there's too much narrative though. Um, and uh, that tell like that kind of fill in the details just a little for the reader, um, or that was my goal. And I believe that last section is also where the newer poems that have been written well after grad school. So motherhood comes in um, and some stuff that's happened to me since my twenties. <laughs> probably a couple of things. A couple of things. <laughs> um, well, if Daniel will help us, can we look at just a few more images just to um, get them in us? They're just so beautiful. A little bit, Trisha, sometimes they remind me if somebody could give form to things I saw in dreams. I don't know if that, does that make any sense to you at all? It, that I, resonates with me, that. Lydia, because the book is a lot about dreaming. So yeah. I'll just note that. Yeah. I mean, that's honestly the highest compliment anyone can tell me <laughs> about artwork. I, I I feel like there is this dreamlike quality to Marissa's writing and and there is the all those associates associations, associations, excuse me. And I, I mean, I think these are just the leaps that my brain made as I was reading those words. And, and it's almost hard to articulate like how I got to those points as I was making the visuals. But I, I mean, the words really were the starting point, the inspiration point. And it was a lot of just like taking words or little pieces and being like, all right, well, how, how can I make something interesting out of this that, that that gives a feeling to what's going on? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the syntax of, of dreams, if you guys will let me say it like that, um, you know, flower is to hand, is to desk, is to fish, is to road sign. In dreams, those associations or patterns make complete sense. Like we would never question that. And in some ways, poetry is too. Ooh, this is one of my favorite ones. Um, Trisha, can you talk to us? Anything you want to say about this one? I was just mesmerized by it. Oh, goodness. I feel like there was the poem that inspired it was just, it talked about like sweet grass and, and, and there was this idea of the seed of things and the start of things. And, and I wanted to get this like, almost like swirling motion happening around that, that origin point that is the seed. Um, and I happened, I remember I also happened to be reading the book Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer as I was reading that. So that definitely like kind of seeped into some of these, this, this particular image as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, I love Ma Marisa. Oh, that one's a great one too. Daniel, come on, you gotta love that one. Um, another thing I love about both the writing and the drawings is that interpretation just opens up because like this one I said Daniel for a reason it's because uh, Daniel's cat is beloved to the corporeal writing squad and so the word the word cat or the image cat kind of opens up into interpretation space like it would in a dream and so the reader's there with like 
300 interpretations rather than a one-to-one. -one ah, that one's so beautiful. Ah, I'm sorry, I lost speech for a second there. That is so good. And I see that. This is one of my favorites. I, I feel like this captures so much of my life. Forget the book. Like the, this image is just, yeah. Like say more, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. I don't know like what's happening in the sky. The house is upside down, but it's still together. It's still like a presentable house. You've got the flowers growing out of the bottom, but you've also got those kind of scary looking leafless trees. Um, and there's a lot of like for me, there's a lot of movement in this picture. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not it's kind of angry, which feels true to my life in the house that looked like that. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, I see. And um, the the possibilities are tricky because like maybe those are mildly scary or really scary looking trees or maybe their roots or maybe their right. blood vessels or maybe, you know, I like the different connotations and denotations that are possible. Um, oh, just so stunning. Um, maybe like one more. Yeah. Can you do the bird feeder, Daniel? This is my favorite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love this. Can you guys talk about that one a little bit? Trisha, I don't think I gave you any direction here. I think I just told you, oh wait, we talked about the bird. I was gonna say, we talked about the bird because this was, I forget the title of the poem, but the poem specifically references the bird. And I, I asked you what what type of bird you were envisioning. Cause I really liked this idea. And, and you'll you'll notice throughout, like I have dahlias and dandelions throughout the all the illustrations and that's like one of the themes that I sort of clung to to kind of tie them all together and in this one I there was a bird feeder mentioned and I really liked this idea of the flowers being encapsulated in this space and like what sort of visual that would represent and, and I asked Marisa what type of bird we'd look for and um she sent me a few different options to choose from and, and i sort of this is gonna lead to it. me admitting why i picked the kind of yes. bird i picked oh geez <laughs> okay um i wanted a yellow bird uh that is a bright eyes reference i have a yellow bird tattoo and i'm a bright eyes nerd and there's just nothing else to say about that i'm 38 years old and i love connor obers uh <laughs> so you're not so, yeah. bizarre uh, <laughs> Trish, I didn't hear what you said. Yeah, no, I just said you're not you're not alone. I also love Connor O'Bears and Bright Eyes. I think we've actually had this conversation probably when we were I think talking we have. about the bird. Um, but also like I love how she fit the cobwebs in there with the flowers. Um I don't know. There's something really compressed about this one that but there's so much happening inside of it that I really like. I mean, it's everything, everything was pulled from from your words. I, I, absolutely every little thing. I mean, you gave me every sort of inspiration I could possibly wish for. It was so incredible to work from them. You know what that makes me think we should do next, Maurice? <laughs> it seems like it would be a perfect and beautiful time for Marisa to read to us a little bit, if that's okay feeling to you right now, Marisa. I can do that, yes. I have some poems to read. Um, okay, let me get them in front of me. So I'm gonna read uh, four or five poems from the book and I'm gonna read a couple of new poems and I promise this will take less than 10 minutes altogether. So I'm um, just gonna go ahead and get started. First poem is called Skeleton Collector. The bones were buried years ago, buried yesterday. We're never really buried and now we dig. We are digging every day and someone is sure we've dug deeper than the bones were buried, but the bones are not there. The drawer is empty. It isn't a trick, but it isn't an accident. She had a special brush. She thought if she brushed the bones and murmured her quiet prayer, she could give them the answers. She could collect her paycheck. She could go home. But the bones are not there and the brush, she'd had it in her hand just a moment ago, just yesterday, 10 years ago, it's gone. Fossil recorder. The moon as giant tape recorder. The moon as preserver of evidence, internal and external. The moon as recording signals, distinctive changes carved on rock. Even on the moon, there is language. If not covered up, the recorded signal is overwritten and destroyed by later events. The coverage of old material by younger material. The moon tries to protect the signal. 
to preserve the fossil, to develop other processes. The moon too buries the record. The result of this coverage is to remove surface material from further processing, from wear and tear, from the inevitable subsequent impacts that will disperse the buried material. Jesus figure. In the beginning, there was stumbling, was gasp, was need to believe. We walked around the square blocks again and again and again. Is that when the circling began? I think it began then and had already been. Even in the beginning, there was foxhole, was patch, was need for air. Trash bins knocked over, knocked around, and garbage strewn, that's when it became windy, became messy, bits of wreckage in her hair. Father figure. The scene refuses to be set. There might have been a moment when she could have climbed out, but the window was locked, or there was no window. Not afraid of heights, not afraid of climbing, not really sure what to be afraid of, so the answer is everything. Search through the records of sleeping, the ratio of dream to nightmare. Last night in a dream, I killed you. Early this morning, I killed you. The desperation shaking the air in waves. Set the scene in the bedroom and the bedroom disappears. Okay, I'm gonna read one more poem from the chapbook and this is the poem uh, with that, with the sweet grass and chrysalis image that Lydia loved. So uh, it's called Tugging at the Edges. Last spring, I grew sweet grass for the cat. As sprouts shot up and bent toward the slivers of sunlight coming through the slats, I pulled one seed from the soil and considered. Roots firm to the earth, green up in the air. I tug at the worn edges of metaphor. The chrysalis begins to split, slowly opens to allow the new spring limbs a space to unfurl in the world. Okay, now I'm gonna read a poem that I have never read out loud before uh, because today I got an email from Hobart, a kind of dream journal for me, that they'd like to publish this. So this will be out in the world sometime in the next few months and I'm gonna read it to you now. And it's called Gut Reno. Take down to the studs, dismantle walls, yank up floorboards, rip roof till the black chasm of foundation fills with sun. What could be illuminated? Scrape for bone and craft from it a starting place. Pull hope in from the corners. Lift each stone, even those heaviest ones hiding in the back garden. Let light slip underneath. Let be the gasping kindness. Inch becomes foot, becomes yard, becomes property unfenced, finds freedom. What doesn't need a home? What chafes at root? Insist on patience, demand premise, acknowledge underpinning, explore what exists despite, inside, because of. The gulf between safety and staying is an illusion. Rebuild is not retread, return is not retreat. Make of it a life's project. Construct sentence as groundwork. Reimagine the story's structure concretely. Become the sunlit basement, building ever upward into a grammar of blue sky. And this one is called Pandas. This is my one pandemic poem. So, so this one is very clearly about life in a pandemic with a seven-year-old. Pandas. At night, while my son sleeps fierce after another day spent learning how to be human at the end of his world, I open my laptop and watch the pandas at the National Zoo. They gnaw bamboo, lumber around the enclosure, I think caged. The pandas are not graceful, but they are beautiful. Often, I watch them sleep. The pandas sleep, my son sleeps, my husband sleeps down the hall. In the morning, school calls snow day. There is no room to breathe inside this house. The pandas play in the snow. I attend two meetings in my laptop, teach my son to take deep breaths, to mute himself before becoming frustrated on screen. The pandas exist always nearby to each other on my iPhone as I text with friends each too far from me. The sun comes up regardless. The pandas sleep. I watch my ceiling fan spin ceaseless. Wait for the house to stir, make clean.
And one last new poem, uh, and then I will stop reading. And this one's called Lesser Gods. Held back, gentle, unhurried, persistent hum underneath. Intricate, amended, whetted appetite bent to patience. Silent hours considered, arched brow, blanketed foot, pressure of thumb on spine, slid tongue down stomach, lash against cheek, worth weight, conditional, worth discomfort, unsettle long-held habits, do not demand, discern delicate palm upturned, stone steady, rear at shouted doubt till dust settled shape emerges, shake loose lesser gods, hesitate, Hasty promise, candles flicker, rough kindness, its own fanned flame. Burned skin, invested elbow, skein of whispered secret, inch from frowning grace. Reinvented reckless myth, drawn, mapped landmine. Provocative argument for resolution, mouth bloody with language. Okay, I'm going to stop talking now. Thank you. Oh, well, it's okay with all of us if you just read for the whole night. It's so beautiful and complicated, beautiful. Um, thank you so much. Let me, let me say to humans here, if you begin to have questions, we can include them. You can do your hand raise thing, or you could put them in the chat and Daniel and Katie will help us if I start going on about something. <laughs> they'll, they'll get my attention. So if it's something you want to do, feel free. Uh, Marisa, let me ask you a question. Um, I feel very intimate with the kind of themes and content um, in the book. And so Partly, I mean that in terms of moving through trauma spaces. Uh, and so I'm a kindred soul is all I'll say about that. And we've actually mentioned that to each other before. But where another writer might have made um, a kind of traditional or cliche journey line from trauma to healing, which is fine. That's one way to tell the story. <laughs> Brilliant, you did something different in my opinion. Instead of a, an easy line from trauma to healing, it's sort of like trauma undergoing alchemy or something. And, and so there's like rearrangements and things that are on top coming to the bottom, like in the images, you know, the upside down house and, and words being beautiful, but then a mouth being blood. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that relationship between trauma and healing in your work? I mean, I would love to pretend that that's my brilliance. I feel like that that too is my life. I mean, my trauma is not resolved. I am not fully healed. Uh, it is an ongoing practice for me, um, particularly as a mom of a young child. I um, have, uh, you know, in the last couple of years, particularly in the pandemic, uh, gone through whole new uh, realizations about my my trauma, um, particularly the childhood trauma that, yes, this book navigates quite a bit around my father. Um, and so I think that this is how, this is what's true for me. For me, that narrative of we, you know, have trauma and then we heal it, it doesn't work, it doesn't fit. Um, and so I have to kind of challenge that and create something else because that doesn't fit my life. Um, you know, I'm a person who at first asked to go to therapy when she was like 10 years old. So I did start that process early, but it, you know, it comes in waves. Um, and I think I wanted the language about trauma to reflect that, uh, you know, and Lydia, I've heard you talk brilliantly also about this many times about trauma not needing to fit, um, you know, that clean narrative and how we should all be pushing back against that. Um, I don't, I know lots and lots of people who live through trauma and most of them have not had a clean narrative healing from that trauma. Uh, so I, I think that this messiness and um, upside downness and like we swing this way, we swing that way feels more real to me.
Yeah, it's sense. really, it's captured in your imagery too, Tricia. Um, some of the ones we saw really make it clear. Um, uh, but, but the sort of journey is made more complicated both in image and poem. It's a similar question to ask you about hope, Marisa. There's a part in a poem that says, hope as smoldering embers. That's definitely not your garden variety definition of hope. Um, even that- No, I'm talking a little bit to Emily Dickinson there as I, yeah, I got it. <laughs> often am in my poems. Um, but uh, hope is a complicated word for me. And I've actually been talking to Emily Dickinson about that poem in particular for uh, decades. This is one of the first poems I ever read. Um, so I think, I mean, I hope is, I am the kind of person who is both eternally hopeful and always prepared to be disappointed by people. And those two things tug inside of me so dramatically at times. Um, I will take grand leaps um, of hope, uh, like buying a literary magazine, <laughs> um, for instance, or, you know, quitting that after five years and becoming an editor and moving to Chicago in a pandemic. Uh, yeah, I do things I like noticed. that. <laughs> but, you know, on the other hand, like I'm a super pessimistic, like, let's be real about how terrible the world is. Everyone's going to hurt me kind of person. So I think, um, I think I think about hope a lot. And in the last couple of years in particular, for the world, for my child, I've been thinking about hope a lot. And what, what does it mean to be hopeful? Um, I did a reading at some point during the pandemic, you know, time is a little weird now, um, where Franny Choi was reading uh, and um, said something about hope as a practice. And ever since I have been thinking about that, about how I need to practice hope. I need to put more effort into being hopeful. Um, and so I think, I think I have a lot of new poems that are also actually wrangling with the idea of hope. I don't think this is something I'm done with. I think it's one of the, the things I'm really interested in poking at. Well, I was, so um, hope as a thing with feathers has always been hard for me. <laughs> Um, and when I got to your poem about smoldering embers, I'm like, okay, now we're talking. <laughs> now, now I can understand this concept. And so um, it was quite beautiful for me personally. <laughs> um, do you want to say anything about your sort of poetic practice or approach to the content of motherhood? Um... Huh, that's a hard question that no one's ever asked me before. So I, I always feel torn about writing about my child. I'll say that first. So he doesn't appear very often and that's intentional. Um, and as he gets older, that may change, you know, depending on the conversations we have and what he's comfortable with. But as a young child, I mean, I, I'm careful about that. So that's the first thing I'll say. Uh, also, I both feel inclined to push against being told motherhood doesn't belong in my poetry because my, I do think of myself as kind of a weirder, more experimental poet. And I've gotten feedback, sure, in workshops that like, you know, this is not the place for the domestic because who hasn't gotten that feedback? And I want to say, fuck you to that feedback and write more about it. Um, but at the same time, you know, I was raised in America and uh, I have a little voice inside my head that says like, this is not important enough to be in a poem. Um, so I, I think writing about motherhood is really hard for me. Um, and for that, for that stupid cliched reason, because I've been told over and over again that it's like not worthy of poetry. So I, I try to find I don't know, and I'll go back to that first thing about not wanting to center it on my son. I try to talk about what what is motherhood for me? Yeah. And in his early life, that's been a lot about understanding myself, like kind of through the mirror that he allows for. Um, and I'm thinking now of that poem in the book, which is about my son, ostensibly uh, the poem control, but it's also, it's really about my OCD. Um, and it's not, it's not about him at all. Uh, and so um, I think, and it's about my trauma, sure, in my childhood. I think that, um, 
oh, who says motherhood doesn't belong in poetry? Too many white men uh, is the answer. Don't listen to them though, they're wrong. Um, you know, I, writing about motherhood is very complicated. I also, I, again, you know, my child's only seven and I, I'm just feeling my way through motherhood. So I imagine that later on in my life, there's going to be a lot of writing about motherhood. It's something I have a lot of thoughts about. But what you see in this book is kind of the extent of what exists. And that Panda's poem that I read, yeah. that's newer. That's that's the kind of the first time I've approached that material again in a while. Yeah, I mean, I have this theory and nobody agrees with me, but I, it's never bothered me. Um, I have this theory that if, if humans who enter the space of motherhood ever told the full truth about it in the languages that make sense to them, it would crack the world open. And, and how would that be? <laughs> you know, it would be like a kind of explosive shattering of the universe. And um, so I'm kind Spoiler of- Spoiler alert, Lydia's new novel does that a little bit. So when it comes out, go, go get it, please. <laughs> I'm getting closer and closer to annihilation, <laughs> but, you know, as a creative space with a smiley face, so, um, or, you know, pretty turtles, it'll be fine. Um, <laughs> I want to ask you both a question, um, which I, it has a lead in, which is, do you both know what bower birds are? I do. Oh, let's, let's share it with Marisa. Tell, tell Marisa what bower birds are. They're essentially these birds that are collectors. They, they collect things. Oh, like um, magpies? Kind yeah, of. It, okay. Sort of in the way magpies do. I think, I think they're more extensive in their- They color. are, in this way. So they, they collect things and then they make fucking elaborate nests on the ground. I'm going to go down a Google wormhole later, I feel. Yeah, like. you will. On the <laughs> that are much bigger than them with elaborate colors and textures, like, like a whole bunch of blue bottle caps and blue pieces of, um, you know, chipped paint at the entrance of this giant nest, all to attract, you know, another bowerbird. And so why this is important, and you will go down a rabbit hole, Marisa, they are so amazing. <laughs> Um, this, there's one. Oh, see, look, that's a nest. That's crazy. That's a bower bird getting it down. So cool. So why? It's an like art sculpture. It is. They all are. And some of them have shells and some of them have rocks and it's just whatever's around the bower bird, it will make that incredible installation art. <laughs> Um, and so why I brought that up is the book for me is a little bit like that intensity of um, collection, curation, drawing the reader in. Is, is that an idea you could both speak to a little or is that just nutter Lydia? <laughs> I'll talk to it in terms of language first. I think that's absolutely right. I think I feel very separate from most of these poems now, with the exception of some of those at the end in that I wrote them so long ago and they feel, but yeah, I mean, this is a collection of, let's say the first 20 years of, of my life and the experiences I lived and then the way I turned them into words. And then, you know, as I, and I, cause I haven't said this yet. So let me say this out loud. This is not an autobiography. This is a poetry collection. So, uh, you know, I guess the way in which I'm a bower bird is that I am taking all of the things that I have experienced and seen and heard and felt in those first 20 years of my life and mashing them and compressing them into these poems that create this book. And so that, yeah, I can kind of like now say like, okay, I have put that in here. And, you know, there actually is like something that really feels uh, not tidy. It's not done. I mean, there's, there's like everything that came after these first 20 years, but there's a lot that's reckoned with in this book uh, that I don't feel like I need to think about anymore. And that's kind of nice uh, because I did that compression and construction and creation. And if I do that enough and I edited it enough and it's been 20 years, then, uh, you know, I can at some, that's part, I think, you know, I, I'm i not gonna go all the way to writing is therapy for me, but I am, you know, a disciple of Melissa Phoebos and I will stare at my navel all day long. And, uh, you know, I do believe that the practice of poetry for me 
is part of my healing. It's not just part of my healing. It's part of my understanding the world. It is how I understand the world. I have been writing poetry truly since I was eight years old. So uh, it's, it's kind of, it's like breathing. Um, and, and I do that by, yeah, grabbing everything I see and shoving it in there and yeah. then pulling stuff out and pruning. Yeah, distilling, curating. Yeah, I love this answer. That made me really happy. Trisha, does this resonate for you? I know, I know, I happen to know you were in a show. Called Bowerbird? Yes. yes. <laughs> you did your research. It's been a while since I was in that show. I was like, uh, yeah. <laughs> you said Bowerbird and I was like, oh, I love Bowerbirds. Um, and oh my goodness. Yeah, so I, this resonates with me big time, both in like my approach to this book, my approach to my art practice, my approach to life. Like, I feel like when I was, you know, diving into these illustrations, it was very much like going, sifting through Maurice's words and being like, I want to pick out a little bit of that. I want to pick out a little bit of that. And then from there, I mean, it would, it would, I was obviously, you know, bringing in my own influences on that. I feel like this is how I approach every project and how most humans approach art. Like you have all these influences in the background that inevitably like seep their way into your work. And um, I'm, I'm very, uh, I think it's pretty obvious with all the flowers throughout the illustrations that I, I love nature and that's like my main source of inspiration. And so the fact that there was so much beautiful imagery in this particular book to work with and sort of like pull that out and grow illustrations from was just a delight to do. So oh, yes, that's definitely so right. That's such a cool way of saying that. Pull that out and grow illustrations from it. Ah, I love how you just put that. That is beautiful. Do you, the truth. <laughs> oh, I can see it. I believe you entirely. Um, do you both think, um, do you think you become a different person after a project comes to completion? This tracks back a little bit to what you were just saying, Marisa. Um, the honest answer feels like I'm not sure yet. This just came out last Friday. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I don't feel like a different person in that there are some ways in which I am always kind of so much me. Um, I cert, I mean, this is the, this book would not have been nearly as fun for me if I hadn't worked with Trisha and the art hadn't been part of it. So the collaboration kind of um, gave me a different way to think about the editing and writing of the book. So there's that. I mean, there's something about my craft, I think, that was affected by the presence of art in the book. And I think that has continued to affect me as I write new poems. Um, the biggest change after spending so much focused energy is that I am writing a lot of poetry again. So that's what's changed most for me about having this project feel done and finished is that like I've kind of moved on to tackle, well, moved on. Um, I mean, you, there's so many of the same themes and um, this, this new project definitely is is even more directly in conversation with Dickinson and uh, would you'd know it was written by the same person as Fixed Stars, but, um, but it's also totally different. So I think, but I, I'm not sure if that was the book. I don't, I don't know. Or if that's just the time that passed while the book happened. Um, poems are always running through my head. So that's just, I get like, it's just so, I've lived with these in particular for a very long time. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I think whatever's going to change about them being out in the world, that's only just starting to happen now. So ask me again next year, Lydia, and I'll let you no. know. Oh, I'm going to stay on it. Also, I want you to answer. So it's a question I have about myself. So I was looking to you to answer a question about. So could you get on that, please? Um, and I, will, I will keep notes and uh, report back. Trisha, um, do you have a sense of, you know, alchemy, alchemical change or transformation when you're, you know, in the visual art sphere? Yeah, oh, goodness, this is such an interesting question. I, I feel that in the sense that, that like, I guess I always feel that through every project. Like I always learn a little something new, a little something that I didn't know was there before. Yeah. And, and most of the time I don't even realize what I learned until the next project. And then I'm diving in and I'm approaching it in a, in a way that 
I wouldn't have before the last project. Yeah. Um, so there's that sense. And then, and then there's just like, as a person, I think like Marisa said, like collaborating on this project, this feels like my first like real true artistic collaboration. And I, I was just so pleased to work with Marisa on this. And it, it was just so, such an inspiring process. And um, so in that sense, like now I'm like, I want to collaborate more. This is great. <laughs> That's um, beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. I have to tell you too, when I look at the images in the book, I would like to have wall size versions of them. I would like them to be as big as a wall so I could kind of step into them sort of or rub my face on them. <laughs> <laughs> you're making my day my week my month my year <laughs> they they feel I mean in some ways they feel really physical to me I mean I said that dream thing and that seemed like a lot of us feel that about your work but like that one if it was wall size I could go kind of experience the window the tree the door the couch which is how I inhabit poetry. When I'm reading poetry, I feel like I'm in it if I love it. It doesn't feel other to me. It feels like I'm entering it. Good God. That is just an extraordinary set of images. Okay, now we're just going to have to go talk about that for like an hour. <laughs> I'm sorry. That has so much going on. Um, that I'm probably, half of which I'm probably just bringing to <laughs> That's the best part of art though, right? Yeah. People can interpret it as they see, like everyone's bringing their own experience to it. And it's so interesting to see how people react. I love that part of it. And I, I think I approach my poems similarly, which is to say that my poems feel for me very specific to me, but I am also trying to write them in a way in which they can feel very specific to everyone who's reading them in totally different ways. Um, so like, when someone says to me they're not narrative I'm like well I don't know I mean they feel completely like I know exactly what narrative I'm telling but um but I also want to leave room for them to fit other people's worlds and to like bend in ways that I don't necessarily know they can um and I think Trisha captured that perfectly with the art I agree it's it's a beautiful beautiful collaboration for that reason I also think um, just from my point of view, the space of interpretation is what keeps literature um, an alive organism across time and space. It's when people come to it and say, this text means one thing, it means a, a smaller thing, it means a smaller thing, that literature becomes static and deadened. Um, so that interpretive space is almost everything. It's not just the text by itself, but the relationship between the text, the writer and the reader, and it's it's moves, it moves across time, it's quantum. I mean, Lydia, I know you love the word liminal and the idea of liminal spaces. And I think that's par that's kind of paramount for me in my work. Um, I saw it. Because I feel like I exist always on a liminal space somehow and, and between a window on one side of a window, looking through a window. Windows yep. are big for me, in case. Yeah, that's not clear. It's, window, it's windows and doors and basements and uh, furniture and objects. Fences, yep. yeah, um, yeah. It's not all the in between. Circles, lines. Yep. Um, yeah, no, I've got some, some motifs. I love that though. I'm, I'm, of course I love it. But do you think poetry is more well-suited to render those kinds of spaces? Cause you know, I'm a prose writer. So I'm like, blah, 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 pages and pages trying to represent liminal spaces. And you know, maybe that's just a silly form. <laughs> no, it's not. No, it's not as the all. person who like looks to Lydia as she tries to write prose. Um, so uh, no, because I want more models of weird prose. Um, and I mean, that, that's the prose I'm trying to publish as an editor too. I love weird poetic prose. Uh, so yes, I do think poetry is an easier space for that, but that only makes me even more interested in the prose that can do it too, because it's yeah. harder to do it in prose. Um, there's something that's just inherently more concrete and less associative about a block of prose, a novel, like yeah. some, something of that nature. No, and so, troubling that is fun for me 
Um, I haven't quite figured it out for myself. I have a couple prose projects that have been in the works for a while. Um, yeah, I don't know. They always end up reading like weird prose poems, very long, weird prose I'm poems. I'm for it. I'm your reader. I'm for it. <laughs> I can't wait. Um, Same. Me. <laughs> well, I, ha I have to ask you both, um, what's next for both of you? Um, you started talking, Marisa, about what's next, but um, and congratulations on your recent leap. It is beautiful. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, that's mostly what's next for me right now is getting from New York to Illinois, um, which has proved challenging because the world, yay, um, everything going so smoothly out there. Um, but uh, I'm really excited to be doing the same work I was doing at the Rumpus, but in the space of book publishing. Um, and so, and to kind of try and shake things up a little there uh, and see, you know, um, what about that system I can trouble and change. Uh, so, um, so there's that. Uh, and then in terms of my writing, uh, yeah, I mean, there, there is the tentative start of a new collection uh, in terms of poetry. Um, and it's about girlhood and Emily Dickinson and horses and horseback riding. I was a writer for a long time. Um, and yes, yeah, still my dad and trauma, uh, but differently than this one. Um, and so, uh, and it, begin, it began with the first long poem I've ever written. It's over a thousand words and 11 pages. Um, and I sent it to someone It was like, look at this weird horse thing. And they were like, this isn't a weird horse thing. This is the start of a book. Uh, and, and she was right. So, um, so that's, that's what exciting. I'm working on. And that's I'm doing 30 for 30 because it's April. So today is the 27th. I have written 27 poems uh, towards this project. So oh my God. Um, amazing. So we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> I can't even read the instructions without having an anxiety attack. Like every time I see that. Oh, there have been anxiety attacks. I can't. Like, what? I can't do it. And what about you, Trisha? What's up next for you? Oh, this is a great question. Actually, I feel like this, this whole conversation is inspiring me to start thinking about projects. Uh, Cause to be quite honest, ever since we wrapped up Fixed Stars, I've been more focused on um, my day job, which I work as a, um, designer, a book designer, and then, uh, you know, living in New York, I'm constantly having to move everywhere, <laughs> so I'm in the process of moving yet again, and, and I'm really looking forward to once th that is settled, <laughs> um, trying to, to resolve, like, okay, what, what do I want to make next? Like, I, I, do, I do enjoy the process of making so much, and sometimes it's illustration like this, and then other days it's like, I just want to craft something, I just want to make a thing with my hands, so. Uh, I might get back to like inking again. Um, for this particular book, I did all the drawings on, on my iPad, which was um, a, a new experience for me, like doing exclusively on the iPad. Um, and I loved it. it. It's great. And it's really, really helpful for just like the whole design process. But um, it made me miss like the tactile feel of, of making something with my hands and, and not staring at a screen all day. So yeah. maybe that. Yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> I, um, I'll i do almost anything with my hands. Uh, you free to look at my Instagram. It's just piles of shit. It's like yes. more and more piles of shit. You can't see it, but that shelf has like seven plates of piles of shit. On <laughs> Love it. I relate to this. This is why moving is such a pain for me. There's way too many craft supplies involved. Books and craft supplies. I'm for it. I'm for it. Katie, you're for it too. I know you are. You're also a bower bird. Yes. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited to go Google that. Oh, you're going to love definitely it. definitely what I'm going to be doing tonight. You're going to love it so much. Um, does anybody have a last thing they just have to ask or, or, you know, offer before we thank our amazingly brilliant and beautiful guests for being here? All righty then, thank you all for joining us. Uh, could you maybe unmute yourselves and give some animal noises or, or huzzas to- Our bird noises. Risa and Trisha for- Woo! <laughs> that was wonderful. It's good, right? <laughs> thank you. You are quack, so welcome. Quack. Hi everybody. Oh,
<laughs> I love your book and I love the illustrations. Thank, thank you, you Kelly. Thank you so much. Well, thank, thank you all for coming tonight. Are you kidding? It's our thank pleasure. You. We all love it. Yeah, and Lydia, thank you for doing this, for, for hosting our conversation and to oh, Corporeal for always saying yes to me. Obviously, our for pleasure, things. for sure. We I love you all forward, forever. <laughs> we look forward to our next physical encounter. Oh, so much. I'm coming to Portland in November for the book festival, even if I have to drive in a car there. Seriously, I will be there in November. I miss <laughs> Portland so much. Excellent. We'll, we'll try to get Portland back by then. Well, as long as you're there, we can have a nice big hug. Lydia is one of the only people in the world I like to hug. There's like three people. One of them is Lydia. One of them is Kava Akbar. Uh, they're really good huggers. So yeah, talk I to me if I you want to know which writers give good hugs. I just blushed a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, enjoy the rest of your evenings and all gratitude and love to all of you. Thank you right all so much. Everybody. Thank you.